This is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Sue Neal Frazier? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, including the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Sue Neal Frazier was born in Scotland on March 3, 1954. Her father ran a printing company. Her mother was from a wealthy family who had ties to Tasmania, Australia. Tasmania is an island state of Australia, 150 miles south of the mainland. It is home to about half a million people. At age six, Sue's parents divorced. Her mother brought Sue and her younger brother to Tasmania. Sue married in 1981. The couple had two daughters and divorced not long after this. Sue met a radiologist named Bob Chapel in 1989. They moved into a home together in 1991. They lived in Hobart, the capital of Tasmania. The couple would never marry, but considered themselves in a permanent relationship. In September of 2008, the couple purchased a 53-foot catch called Four Winds. So this was a yacht. They paid $203,000 for it. Apparently, the vessel was not in good shape. It had massive plumbing and electrical problems. The people that they paid to transport the yacht to them, to sail it to them in Hobart, didn't believe the couple was actually capable of sailing it in its condition and considering the condition of the couple, meaning they weren't really physically capable and skilled enough to sail the vessel. On January 26, 2009, at 9 a.m., Bob boarded the yacht to work on it. It was moored in the River Derwent. Sue was with Bob for a brief period and then went ashore using a blue and white inflatable dinghy. She returned to the yacht at about 2 p.m. After this, she once again went ashore. The police would later claim that she returned to the boat later in the evening. Sometime between 11.30 p.m. and midnight that same day, a witness reported seeing an inflatable dinghy coming from the Royal Yacht Club and headed toward Four Winds. The witness said that the dinghy was occupied by one person who had the outline of a female. A different witness would spot the dinghy the next day at 5.40 a.m. bobbing against rocks. At around the same time, people on the shore called the police because they noticed Four Winds was very low in the water. It looked like it was sinking. The police arrived and boarded the vessel. There was no sign of Bob Chapel. In the wheelhouse, the police found a knife on the floor. They also found blood on the steps and on a flashlight. Seawater was coming into the vessel through a pipe that had been severed in the bathroom and through a valve under the floor panel, referred to as a seacock. This is a valve that goes directly through the hull and is used to bring water into the vessel for various purposes, not normally to sink it, but for other non-sinking related activities. The police searched for Bob in the area, but there was no sign of him. They used divers and looked all around. The water was pumped out of the yacht and it was towed to Constitution Dock on January 27. This was nearby. Sue was brought on board. She noticed a few things out of place that she pointed out to the police. A fire extinguisher and an emergency beacon were missing from their respective brackets. A winch handle was in a winch on the main mast, which it normally would not have been because people could hit their heads against it. The handles are removed when the winch is not being operated. There were ropes on the winch which were out of position, like perhaps somebody was using it to lift something off of the deck. Sue told the police that on the afternoon of January 26, she tied up the dinghy at the Royal Yacht Club and went to a hardware store. She was there for several hours, but didn't buy anything. She walked up and down almost every aisle in the store. She told the police what she was wearing and exactly where she walked. Sue said that after spending hours in the hardware store, she went home where she stayed all night until she was notified the next morning that the yacht was sinking. The police checked the surveillance footage at the hardware store, but she was not on it. Sue changed her story a little bit, now saying that she was pretty sure she had gone there, but could not be certain. Another problem for Sue was that the store closed at 6 p.m. She had made it seem like she was there later than that. A few months later, in March, 
Sue told the police something new. She said that she had received a disturbing telephone call on the night of January 26 from a man named Richard King. Worried, she drove to Sandy Bay and looked out at the yacht from a distance. She just wanted to check and make sure everything was okay. When she didn't see anything, she drove home. A few weeks later, Sue said that after she drove to look at the yacht from a distance, she left the car there and walked home because she needed the exercise. On May 5, 2009, during an interview with the police, Sue said that she was mistaken about the whole hardware store situation. She had become confused about what day it was. So she had been to the hardware store, but it was on a different day, not January 26. At this time, she also said that she was on the yacht later than she had indicated before. Sue was charged with murder on August 30, 2009. The prosecution asserted that Sue murdered Bob, used the winch to lift his body into the dinghy, and then used the missing fire extinguisher to weigh down his body. She dumped him somewhere where they could not find him. On October 15, 2010, Sue was found guilty of murder. Twelve days later, she was sentenced to 26 years in prison with a non-parole period of 18 years. Now moving to my analysis. Was Sue Neal Frazier actually guilty? Let's look at the evidence both for and against the idea of guilt, starting with the inculpatory evidence. A witness had spotted a dinghy traveling toward four winds occupied by one person, whose outline appeared to be that of a female. The dinghy from four winds was recovered, bobbing on rocks, instead of where Sue claimed she had left it. When Sue was on board four winds on January 27, the police noticed that she had a fresh cut on her hand. Sue changed her story about where she was on January 26. None of her stories were corroborated. Many involved all kinds of unusual activities like leaving a car someplace and forgetting it was there and then somehow remembering and going back and getting it. It just became very confusing and disjointed. Whoever cut the pipe and opened the seacock under the floor panel must have had intimate knowledge of the yacht. The seacock was very hard to find. It was no longer in use after being bypassed when a new toilet was installed. So whoever did the work simply covered it up with a floor panel, so they left the seacock not attached to anything. In addition, circuit breakers had been flipped so that the bilge alarms would not sound and the bilge pumps would not activate, so the yacht could fill up with water and no alarm would go off and the pumps would not pump the water out. So this would, of course, facilitate the vessel sinking. This makes me wonder if it's a good idea to leave an unused valve that goes through the hull of a ship in place when it's no longer necessary. I would think removing it and patching the hole would be a better idea. It's almost like it's just there to cause problems. I can see a lazy mechanic trying to explain the decision to leave it in there to a concerned yacht owner. Don't think of it as a superfluous valve. Think of it as a self-destruct button. It's just like Star Trek. A handle was left in the winch on the main mast as though someone was trying to lift something heavy off the vessel, perhaps the body of Bob Chapel. Someone had attempted to clean up the crime scene. Anyone could have done this, but the prosecution argued that a stranger would not have cared to. Like, they wouldn't be concerned about that. They would just want to get off the vessel. Sue's reaction to the call from Richard King was suspicious. One theory here was that Richard was calling and wanted to talk to Bob. This made Sue worried that Richard was going to go out to the yacht to see him. She traveled back to the vessel to destroy evidence. Sue's red jacket was found on a fence on Margaret Street, about a half mile south of Constitution Dock. Her DNA was on the jacket. When the police showed her the jacket, she denied it was hers and could not explain why it was there. Now moving to the exculpatory evidence. Bob's body was never recovered. Obviously, that means that no cause of death was determined if Bob is in fact dead. It could not be established that Bob's blood was in the dinghy. Prosecutors showed the jury pictures of luminol inside the dinghy, and the pictures looked very convincing to them. The luminol was reflecting all over the place, but luminol can detect more than just blood. It is just used to screen for blood. It is not the definitive test for the presence of blood. Witnesses saw a dinghy on the starboard side of Four Winds during the afternoon of January 26. The dinghy was aluminum and gray in color instead of inflatable and blue and white in color. 
The DNA of a 15-year-old homeless girl named Megan Voss was found on board Four Winds. The DNA was not identified until sometime after the murder. Megan denied having any memory of being on the yacht or even being in the area of Constitution Dock. The police said that the DNA must have been found in the yacht due to secondary transfer through foot traffic. So they were trying to help Megan out here, like to explain how her DNA was there. Some experts believe the DNA was there through primary transfer, meaning that Megan was almost certainly on the yacht at some point. Megan was living in a homeless shelter in January of 2009, but she denied being in the area at that time. Later, investigators found a shelter in North Hobart that recorded Megan as scheduled to stay there on the evening of January 26, 2009. Megan told the staff that she wanted to sleep in an address in Mount Nelson. She was supposed to call the shelter when she arrived at Mount Nelson and provide them the phone number of the individual with whom she was staying. But she never did. So she had an unexcused absence from the shelter. Megan Voss would later change her story in a dramatic fashion. She said that she was, in fact, on board Four Winds on January 26 with two other men who murdered Bob Chapel. One of the men was her 17-year-old boyfriend, and the other was an older homeless man they knew. She and the two men went there to steal valuable items from the yacht. This is something she said her boyfriend did regularly. They were startled that Bob was there. A struggle ensued, and the men killed Bob. Megan vomited after the homicide. That's why her DNA was found on the deck of the vessel. Later, Megan recanted this confession. She claimed that people trying to prove Sue's innocence were harassing her, like they coerced her into telling the story. Investigators made a number of mistakes in this case, like losing evidence and failing to test items found on the vessel. A homeless man with a violent criminal record was on another vessel during the time of the murder, which was right near Four Winds. The police did not investigate him until quite some time after the murder. With all the evidence in mind, do I think that Sue Neal Frazier was guilty? I believe she is guilty in reality, but there's no way she's guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The fact that Megan's DNA was found on the deck of the yacht is incredibly exculpatory, even without Megan's recanted confession later on. There have been cases where people have been convicted based only on their DNA being found at a crime scene, yet Megan was never even charged, and Sue was convicted. What's so interesting in this situation with Megan confessing and recanting is that it creates two very different theories of the crime. Either Sue killed Bob and disposed of his body by herself, or Megan and her two associates committed the crime. One could argue that perhaps Sue was in a conspiracy with the other three, but I don't think this is likely. There would have been no reason to use the winch if there were four people involved in the murder. They could have easily lifted Bob into a dinghy. Another theory is that Sue was only with Megan. But again, this seems like an unusual conspiracy. In my opinion, one theory or the other is probably true. They are distinct. There is not much room for overlap. If Sue is guilty, how did Megan's DNA get on the deck of the yacht? It may have been that she was there at some point before the murder, perhaps engaged in some activity which was illegal, so she didn't want to say anything about it. I suppose it also could have been secondary transfer, which is the prosecution theory of how it got there. I think Sue Neal Frazier was convicted because she just couldn't seem to stop talking to the police. She didn't have to say anything to them, but she chose to say a lot. Early on, she gave an incredibly detailed description of her activities, like the trip to the hardware store, but when describing other activities, she was vague and could not remember important details. If she had never said a word, I doubt she would have been convicted. As far as Sue's personality, there is not a lot of information available. Sue has been described as calm, cool, and collected. The judge who sentenced her said that she did not kill in the heat of the moment. This was not based on impulsivity. Rather, Sue was deliberate. She planned the murder carefully for some time and had a clear motive, like money. If Sue is guilty, the motive for the crime is not clear. She really didn't have much to gain monetarily or in any other way from Bob's death. I think what happened here is that Sue believed she planned the perfect crime. She was confident in her abilities. She thought she could easily manipulate and deceive the police. 
but that proved to be more difficult than she expected. When she started getting caught in lies, again, her confidence kicked in. She thought she could deceive her way out of her own deception. Before she knew it, she had been more successful in sinking herself than she had been in sinking four winds. She dug herself into a deep hole, at the bottom of which was nothing but a conviction for murder. Those are my thoughts on the case of Sue Neal Frazier. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be more intriguing than a self-destruct button. Thanks for watching.